Good evening. I'm Jay DeLeon, the Director of Engagement here at NYU Skirball. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Skirball Talks tonight. Skirball Talks is our Monday night speaker series organized this semester in partnership with NYU Reads. Our final event of the semester will be next week, November 25th at 6.30 p.m. with a faculty panel on inequality, bias, and education moderated by Lisa Coleman, and I hope you'll join us for that as well. Now, please welcome Gigi Dupico, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Academic Affairs and for the Humanities. Good evening. Thank you, Jay, and thanks to the Skirball staff. I'm delighted to welcome you to Skirball Talks and to NYU Reads. We have a very special evening in store for you, a celebration of writers and writing at NYU. You're gonna be hearing from six extraordinary writers, all on the faculty of NYU's creative writing program, who will be feasting us with their words. Individually, any one of them could be said to have shaped contemporary American letters. Collectively, they're a tour de force and make up the very best creative writing program anywhere. And so it's my very special privilege to introduce the person who is the architect and builder of that program, who is herself an amazingly gifted poet and who will be moderating this evening. Deborah Landau is the author of four collections of poetry, Soft Targets, The Uses of the Body, The Last Usable Hour, All Landman Literary Selections, and Orchid Delirium, winner of the Anhinga Prize for Poetry. The Uses of the Body was featured on NPR's All Things Considered and included on Best of 2015 lists by The New Yorker, Vogue, BuzzFeed, and O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, among others. A 2016 Guggenheim Fellow, her work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Paris Review, Tin House, American Poetry Review, Poetry, CNN, The Wall Street Journal, and The New York Times, and included in a number of important anthologies. Landau was educated at Stanford, Columbia, and Brown, where she was a Javits Fellow and received a PhD in English and American Literature. She's a professor and director of the Creative Writing Program in NYU's Faculty of Arts and Science. Please join me in welcoming professor and poet Deborah Landau. Thank you, Gigi, for that generous introduction and for all you've done for creative writing at NYU. It's great to see so many people here. A couple more thank yous. I want to thank Ryan Pointer in the Provost's office, Joanna Yaz, Soren Stockman, and Bernard Ferguson in creative writing. And finally, Jay DeLeon here at Skirball and everyone who had a hand in making tonight happen. One announcement, unfortunately, Jeff Eugenides couldn't be here tonight and he sends his sincere regrets. It's wonderful to have an opportunity to celebrate and showcase creative writing at NYU. The creative writing program here is thriving. We have programs for graduate and undergraduate writers in New York and in Paris, as well as a summer intensive for undergraduates in Florence. Our students are marvelously talented and diverse, are graduating with MFAs and publishing books, winning MacArthur's, National Book Awards, and Pulitzer Prizes at a rate that's impossible to, catch, to keep up with. At the heart of the program are our world-class, magnificent faculty. Here are six of the finest writers alive, all of whom are also dedicated teachers and mentors to our students here at NYU. Any given day of the week, you can find them at Writer's House on 10th Street, tending to student poetry, fiction, nonfiction with great care in office hours and in our classrooms. I'm going to introduce them all as a group in the interest of time so we can get to the readings. And they're going to read in alphabetical order, each for a little over 10 minutes, and then afterwards there'll be a book signing and a reception, so we hope you'll join us for that. Collectively, these six writers have published 61 books and won way too many prizes for me to name. First um, to be reading is internationally celebrated and best-selling author Jonathan Safran Foer, most recently the author of We Are the Weather, a nonfiction book about climate change and what to do about it. Next will be Professor Terence Hayes. Terence is the newest addition to our senior faculty. 
a MacArthur Fellow. His most recent book of poems is American Sonnets to My Past and Future Assassin. Next will be Pulitzer Prize winning poet Yusuf Komunyaka, author most recently of The Emperor of Water Clocks. And Yusuf has been the guiding inspiration behind our veterans writing workshop here at NYU since its inception. Next will be distinguished writer Nick Laird. Nick's a triple threat. He writes poems, he writes fiction, he writes nonfiction. A recent Guggenheim Fellow, his newest book of poems is called Feel Free. After Nick, Pulitzer Prize winning poet Sharon Olds will read. Sharon's been a beloved mentor and teacher to students here at NYU for over 35 years. She was a founder of our cherished Goldwater Writers Workshop, um, which sends our students into a hospital on Roosevelt Island to work with disabled patients there. Her new book, just published last month, is called Arias. And finally, the singular Zadie Smith, whose newest book, Grand Union, shows us that in addition to being one of our most astute essayists and beloved novelists, she's also a masterful short story writer. Albert Camus famously claimed that the purpose of a writer is to keep civilization from destroying itself. A word after a word after a word is power wrote Margaret Atwood. How fortunate we are to have these magnificently powerful writers in our midst at this critical point in history. Please welcome Jonathan Safran Foer. Hello. Um, when I was 13, my older brother dragged me to a reading of the American Academy of poets, and I wasn't particularly interested in literature at the time, and I didn't read very much, I didn't grow up reading very much. And that night, there were maybe 12 or 13 readers, including, I remember, W.S. Merwin, and James Merrill, and Stanley Kunitz, and I remember Stanley Kunitz read a poem, I think called Touch Me. In any case, it ended with um, a line addressed to his wife, um, imploring her to touch me and remind me of who I am. And it really changed me, and I've remembered it as being one of the most just special moments of my life, special nights of my life. And I haven't been as excited to attend a reading uh, since then until tonight and uh, to share the stage with these other writers who I not only get to listen to tonight, but get to actually work with and share a house with on 10th Street um, and run into regularly, and it's been not only a treat and a gift, but a real blessing in my life, um, which I'm extremely grateful for. I'm gonna read very briefly from a book that I published a couple of months ago called We Are the Weather, which is about climate change and why, it's a nonfiction book, and why um, it's so hard to um, care about in our lives rather than just in our minds. In 1942, a 28-year-old Catholic in the Polish underground Jan Karski embarked on a mission to travel from Nazi-occupied Poland to London and ultimately America to inform world leaders of what the Germans were perpetrating. In anticipation of his journey, he met with several resistance groups, accumulating information and testimonies to bring to the West. After surviving as perilous a journey as could be imagined, Karski arrived in Washington, D.C. in June 1943. There, he met with Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter, one of the great legal minds in American history and himself a Jew. After hearing Karski's accounts of the clearing of the Warsaw Ghetto and of exterminations in the concentration camps, after asking him a series of increasingly specific questions, like what's the height of the wall that separates the ghetto from the rest of the city? Frankfurter paced the room in silence, then took his seat and said, Mr. Karski, a man like me talking to a man like you must be totally frank. So I must say, I'm unable to believe what you told me. When Karski's colleague pleaded with Frankfurter to accept Karski's account, Frankfurter responded, I didn't say that this young man is lying. I said that I am unable to believe him. My mind, my heart, they're made in such a way that I cannot accept it. 
Frankfurter didn't question the truthfulness of Karski's story. He didn't dispute that the Germans were systematically murdering the Jews of Europe, his own relatives. And he didn't respond that while he was persuaded and horrified, there was nothing he could do. Rather, he admitted not only his inability to believe the truth, but his awareness of that inability. Our minds and hearts are well built to perform certain tasks and poorly designed for others. We're good at things like calculating the path of a hurricane and bad at things like deciding to get out of its way. Because we evolved over hundreds of millions of years in settings that bear little resemblance to the modern world, we're often led to desires, fears, and indifferences that neither correspond nor respond to modern realities. We're disproportionately drawn to immediate and local needs. We crave fats and sugars, which are bad for people who live in a world of their ready availability. We hypervigilantly watch our children on jungle gyms, despite the many greater risks to their health that we ignore, while remaining indifferent to what's lethal, but feels over there. Although many of climate change's accompanying calamities, like extreme weather events, floods and wildfires, displacement and resource scarcity, are vivid, personal, and suggestive of a worsening situation, they just don't feel that way in aggregate. They feel abstract, distant, and isolated, rather than like beams of an ever-strengthening narrative. As the journalist Oliver Bookerman put it in The Guardian, if a cabal of evil psychologists had gathered in a secret undersea base to concoct a crisis humanity would be hopelessly ill-equipped to address, they couldn't have done better than climate change. So-called climate deniers reject the conclusion that 97% of climate scientists have reached. The planet is warming because of human activity. But what about those of us, and I assume I'm including everybody in this audience, who say we accept the reality of human-caused climate change? We may not think the scientists are lying, but are we capable of believing what they tell us. Such a belief would surely awaken us to the urgent ethical imperative attached to it, shake our collective conscience, and render us willing to make small sacrifices in the present to avoid cataclysmic ones in the future. Intellectually accepting the truth isn't virtuous in and of itself, and it definitely won't save us. As a child, I was often told, you know better when I did something I shouldn't have done. Knowing was the difference between a mistake and an offense. If we accept a factual reality that we're destroying the planet, but are unable to believe it, then we are no better than those who deny the existence of human-caused climate change, just as Felix Frankfurter was no better than those who denied the existence of the Holocaust. And when the future distinguishes between these two kinds of denial, which will appear to be a grave error and which an unforgivable crime. A year before Karski journeyed from Poland to inform the world that the Jews of Europe were being slaughtered, my grandmother fled her Polish village to save her life. She left behind four grandparents, her mother, two siblings, cousins, and friends. She was 20 years old and knew only what everybody else knew. The Nazis were pushing east into Soviet-occupied Poland and were only days away. Asked why she left, she would say, I felt that I had to do something. My great-grandmother, who would be shot at the edge of a mass grave while holding her stepdaughter, watched my grandmother pack her things. They didn't speak. That silence was their final exchange, knowing no less than her daughter, she didn't feel that she had to do something. Her knowledge was only knowledge. My grandmother's younger sister, who would be shot trying to trade a trinket for something to eat, followed my grandmother out of the house that day. She took off her only pair of shoes and gave them to my grandmother. You're so lucky to be leaving, she said. I've been told that story many times. As a child, I heard it as, you're so lucky believing. And maybe it is just luck. If a few factors had been different around the time that my grandmother left, if she'd been ill or if she'd just fallen in love with someone, maybe she would not have been lucky to be leaving. Those who stayed weren't any less brave, intelligent, resourceful, or afraid of dying. 
They just didn't believe that what was coming would be so different from what had already come many times. Belief can't be willed into being, and you can't force someone to believe, not even with better and louder and more virtuous arguments, not even with irrefutable evidence. I sometimes daydream about going from house to house in my grandmother's village, grabbing the faces of those who would stay, and screaming, you have to do something. I have this daydream in a house that I know consumes multiples of my fair share of energy, and I know is representative of the kind of voracious lifestyle that I know is destroying our planet. I'm capable of imagining one of my descendants daydreaming, daydreaming about grabbing my face and screaming, you have to do something, but I'm incapable of the belief that would move me to do something, so I know nothing. The other morning on the drive to school, my son looked up from the book he was reading and said, we're so lucky to be living. One piece of knowledge I don't have, how to square my gratitude for life with behavior that suggests an indifference to it. My grandmother took her winter coat when she left home, even though it was June. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank yous. I was talking to a friend last night about Prince. And I was saying, like, when Prince woke up in heaven, he had to be really disappointed. Like, really? There's no way this could be better than what his life was like on, on, on Earth. That's Prince. So heaven's got to be like a disappointment after such bliss. So uh, I feel something like that. Like, you know, I got best students, graduate and undergraduate. I got best colleagues. So i um, very honored to be here. I'm just going to read you three poems. Um, this one has been called Ars Poetica with Bacon. I think maybe I should call it Hunger or something, something a little more somber uh, or both. All right. Fortunately, the family, anxious about its diminishing food supply, encountered a small, possibly hostile pig along the way. The daughter happened upon it first pushing its scuffed snout against something hidden at the base of a thorn bush, a blood-covered egg, maybe, or a small rubber ball exactly like the sort that snapped from the paddle my mother used to beat me with when I let her down. At the time, the father and mother were tangled in some immemorial dispute about cause and effect. Who'd harmed whom first? how jealousy did not, in fact, begin as jealousy, but as desperation. When the daughter called out to them, they turned to see her lift the pig, it was no heavier than an orphan, from the bushes and then set it down in their path. They waited to see whether the pig might idle forward with them until they made camp or wander back toward the home they'd abandoned to war. Night enclosed in small drops of rain began to fall upon them. Consequence is the word that splintered my mind. Walking a path in the dark is about something the way a family is about something. Like the pig, I too wanted to reach through the thorns for the egg or ball, believing it was a symbol of things to come. I wanted to roll it in my palm like the head of a small red bird until it sang to me. I wanted to know how my mother passed her days having never touched her husband's asshole, for example. Which parts of your body have never been touched? I wanted to ask. I'd been hired to lead the family from danger to a territory full of more seeds than bullets. But truth was, in the darkness, there was no telling what was rooting in the soil. Plots of complete silence. Romantics posing in a field bludgeoned by shame. The heart, biologically speaking, is ugly as it pumps its passion and fear down the veins. Which is to say, starting out, 
we have no wounds to speak of beyond the ways our parents expressed their love. We were never sure what the pig was after or whether it was in fact not a pig, but some single-minded soul hunger had turned into a pig, some devil worthy of mercy. Without giving away the enigmatic ending, I will say, when we swallowed the flesh, our eyes were closed. Uh, here's another like animal one. You know, I wrote all those sonnets. I'll read you one of those after this one and then I'll be done. Um, but I've been trying to do something different, you know. So there's like, there's a pig and then here's a, here's a tree frog. Um, Pseudocris Crucifer. The father begins to make the sound a tree frog makes when he comes with his son and daughter to a pail of tree frogs for sale in a deep south flea market just before the last blood of dusk. A tree frog is called a tree frog because it chirps like a bird in a tree, he tells his daughter, while her little brother, barely four years old, busies himself like a small blues piper with a brand new birthday harmonica. A single tree frog can sound like a sleigh bell, the father says. Several can sound like a choir of crickets. Once in high school, I dissected a frog, and the frog opened its eyes to judge its deconstruction and disassembly, my scooping and poking at its soul. And the little girl's eyes go wide as a tree frog's eyes. Some call it the spring peeper. In Latin, it's called pseudocris crucifer. False locust, toads with falsettos, their chimes issuing below the low leaves and petals, a harmonica playing is so otherworldly, the boy blows with his eyes closed. Some tree frog species spend most every day underground. They don't know what sunlight does at dusk. They are nocturnal insectivores. They may sound like crickets only because they eat so many crickets. But tree frogs mostly sound like birds. The tree frog overcomes its fear of birds by singing. The harmonica playing is so bewitching, the boy gathers a crowd in a flea market in the deep south. A bird may eat a tree frog, a fox may eat the bird, a wolf may eat the fox, and the wolf then may carry varieties of music and cunning in its belly as it roams the countryside. A wolf hungers because it cannot feel the good in its body. The people clap and gather round with fangs and smiles. The father lifts the son to his shoulders, so the boy's harmonics hover overhead over varieties of affections, over varieties of bodies with their backs to a firmament burning and opening. You can find damn near anything in a flea market. Pets, weapons, flags, farm fresh as well as farm spoiled fruits and vegetables, varieties, varieties of old wardrobes, a rusty old tin box with old postcards and old photos of lynchings dusted in the rust of the box. You can feel it on the tips of your fingers, this rust, which is almost as brown as the father and the boy on his shoulders and the girl making the sound a tree frog makes in a deep south flea market before the last blood of dusk just before the last blood of dusk, just before the dusk. Uh, so yeah, you know, I published a bunch of sonnets. I, I started writing them when you know, this dude got in office. He's still there, so I still write him from time to time. And this is like the one I wrote when I thought I was done, when I was like, oh, we're definitely done. Like I, something happened, I thought he was gonna be done, and he wasn't. So. Uh, I'll, I'll finish with this one. American Sonnet for the New Year. Things got terribly ugly incredibly quickly. Things got ugly embarrassingly quickly, actually. Things got ugly unbelievably quickly, honestly. Things got ugly seemingly infrequently, initially. Things got ugly ironically, usually awfully carefully. Things got ugly unsuccessfully, 
occasionally. Things got ugly, mostly, painstakingly, quietly, seemingly. Things got ugly, beautifully, infrequently. Things got ugly, sadly, especially, frequently, unfortunately. Things got ugly, increasingly, obviously. Things got ugly, suddenly, embarrassingly, forcefully. Things got really ugly, regularly, truly, quickly. Things got really incredibly ugly. Things will get less ugly, inevitably, hopefully. It's great to be here. Um, let me find my glasses. I wish to be surprised. Lately, I've been thinking of the built-in constructive limits of artificial intelligence. Yes, AI may achieve mechanical exactitude, but I don't think it can ever achieve authentic feeling compassion, empathy, reverie, premonition, or reflection. But here's a question. When one considers the basic principle of brainwash, that of repetition, can a human being evolve into AI proxy. At that point, are we no longer using technology, but being used by it? Those qualities of compassion, empathy, reverie, and reflection are in jeopardy. This is a little belief of mine. Okay, a world of daughters. Say, lick clean at birth, say, weeping in the tall grass where this tantalizing song begins. Birds pause on a crooked branch over a grave of an unending trek into the valley of cooling waters. Lessons of earth, old questions unmoor the first tongue say, I have gone back, says the oracle, counting seasons and centuries, undoing fault lines between one generation and next, as she twirls sackcloth, edged with pollen, and one glimpses what one did not know, say, this is where the goat was asked to speak legends ago, to kneel and deliver a sacrifice. To feel the truth depends on how and why the singer's song fits into the mouth. Well, I believe the bar, the bar at rib story is the other way around, entangled in decree blessing, law, and myth. One only has to listen to night-long pleas of a mother who used all thousand chants and prayers of clay and red ochre, blown from the mouth upon the high stone walls, retracing a final land bridge to wishbone my own two daughters and granddaughters, the three know how to work praise and lament, how to sprout wings of naked flight and labor, yes, hinge 
in turf. We rose from Lucy to clan, from clan to tribe, and today we worship her son polished bones, remembering she is made of questions. No, mama is not always the first word before counting eggs in the, pow in the cowbird's nest. It begins in memory. Now say her name, Sir Dinkish, mother of us all. I'm going to read two poems from Night Animals. Sever Mysteries of the Platypus. She tries to hide in a swish of wet grass because she remembers the first man like a wound, an old scar, a howl in the hush. Her skin is too rough for the marketplace. Otherwise, she would have fallen under a bullet or knife. She came from an old world, a prototype, the first shimmer pieced together by a prankish god. That first moment of light seeping from the cave an oath written on her back by the edge of a flood. Before she slipped from the egg, she knew a human face could make her heart explode into a clutch of stars. Night, night of the Amadella. You huddle into a shell, a breastplate, a whisper in the dark, summon your can one by one along the frontier in your kingdom, errant night of another growth, even in your gut fear. You're always on the verge of a new boater or at the edge before crossing into the interior of false prophecies. Desert blooms and berries fall into marshy hush. Around a shop curve, planetary lights spring out of nothingness. How did you go wrong. With only blind faith and a dead star left in your eyes, where's North America? You've been around eons, not knowing when you had left one age and entered another. But I found your Olympus of foolish odds in the modern world. Lovers in cars, delivery trucks, make leaves tremble along the roadside. If you know this little suitcase of guts and nails, you are still alive, even with your broken hinges. Okay. I've been saying I would write about the stroke. So uh, I think I'm going to read just two poems on that. This new year. Listen, these dragon tooth 
icicles, ferret by a season between seasons, their icy fangs clinging to ease of houses and bare branches of trees. There is something beautiful here, but also, also frightening. Snowy mounds this hard new year, marking my bones for bad times and good times to come. I don't know where the lightning came from, but it began in the left hemisphere and circled out the right side of my body, leaving its mark. In fact, I'm sleeping now. The fields Snowy tufts of dead grass reminds me of fluffy pillars. Love, where am I? No, I can't lift my foolish right arm, always trying to encircle and hold joy too close. I was once a fast walker, moving ahead and back, then the past fingers tapping a ceramic shaker. Yes, my love for salt unblessed me. Each half step I tried not to take warmth of a name in my mouth. What had almost taken me away? A phantom stood shaking his head beside my hospital bed. I could hear my doctor years ago saying to me, your ancestors cross the Atlantic. Craven salt down in the ship's hole. A darkness fell onto snowy shapes behind my eyes. How many hours passed before the kiss on my lips? Look out at white cold and frost, recalling early deaths of childhood friends, pork flanks tied with grass hanging from smokehouse rafters. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Stop my leg from shaking. <laughs> big sign up here it says do not touch the mic so they will make a terrible noise so I'm going to do what Terence did and hunch over it like this <clears throat> I hope that's all right many thanks to Deborah um, for uh, having us all here um, many thanks to NYU for employing us many thanks to my colleagues uh, not just those I'm reading with tonight uh, and many thanks to my students for putting up with me um, we've got the best faculty it's just uh, no arguments. So they told us to talk briefly about what we were thinking about. All I've been thinking about is impeachment. Um, so yeah, I know. Finally, it's going our way. So um, I am not going to talk about impeachment. Jonathan told me I should cede all my time to him, which is what they do in the hearings. Um, I'm not going to cede my time to him. I'm going to read f uh, four or five short poems. I know people like to know how many poems you're going to read because they get a bit tense and the despair, the despair sets in. Um, so there's a word prick in this poem I'm going to read. I think it's an Irishism if you call someone a prick. It's the, the American equivalent is, I guess, like a jerk or an asshole, possibly a douchebag. Um, 
It's it's not a dickhead. A, a prick is slightly meaner um, and sort of smarter than a dickhead, in case you were. Uh, it's all about the language. So um, anyway, so that, that's what that word is, prick. This first poem is called To the Woman at the United Airlines Check-in Desk at Newark. <laughs> <laughs> no, she, she's not the prick. I'm the prick in the poem. <clears throat> Shanique, I am in time, and I know your fight is hard. The fight is hard for everyone alive, and all those bodies and departures are naked, under clothes and scarred. That granted, even deeper scratches welt and heal in days, though still they smart on contact. And I never really cared for the terms I struck with earth, more total war than limited skirmish. I seethe, Shanique. I drink, I smoke weed and seek relief from mental anguish, the peopled life, car horns sounding down on Houston. All three kinds of knowledge fox me, outer, inner, pure mathematics, but I understand your relatives are dying also, and I know the days are slow, the years fast, that these are facts I ever surprising. Like you, I think the worst is yet to come. Plus, there's time lifting everything in sight, Shanique, pocketing orchids and mothers, the little white pebble-dashed bungalows, you in your small corner and me in mine. Let me be clear and accommodative, more like water than ice, and raise my hands to show I mean no harm and that I'm stupid and malicious, and if I'm trying to be fearless, I know it gives me no right to act like this. What's understood is I'll be filed beneath the pricks, and fair enough. Very seldom do I note the world wears a single face with endless variations, and even then, Shanique, it tends to be a face like yours, one particularly fine. Speaking of which, your fluorescent orange lipstick lip curls up at me with such distaste I have to sit down now on my case at the rush of shame I feel and also love and of course lust, hate, remorse. Okay, now don't, 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 don't clap, I much prefer the awkward silence. <laughs> what, what happens is if you, like, if you clap for one and then you don't clap for another one then that would be terrible. So let's just not do any clapping. Um, just read a wee short poem here called Silk Cut. Um, my mother died uh, two years ago, and uh, Silk Cut is a little poem about my father after. Silk Cut's the name of a brand of cigarettes that um, in, in Ireland uh, and in Britain that my father smoked for 40 years. I was five and stood beside my dad at a junction somewhere in Dublin when I slipped my hand in his and met the red end of a cigarette. But now our hearts are broken. We walk down to the bray side where we can get a proper pint and his voice tears up a bit about the emptiness in the house. And we are heading home, waiting at the turn for the traffic when I find I have to stop my hand from taking his. So I've lived in New York for about 10 years now, and I was thinking the other day about becoming an American. And then I thought, I'm not sure I want to be an American. Um, I do want to be a New Yorker, but I kind of already am one. Um, the start of this poem, New York, New York Elasticity, owes um, a couple of phrases to E.L. Doctorow, our late great colleague um, at NYU and at the Lillian Vernon House. Um, they're from Doctorow's introductory lines to the Ken Burns documentary about New York which if you haven't seen, you really should. Um, Dr. O talks about that magic of the multiple parallel universes sort of coexisting in New York. New York elasticity. When the hand is red, some of the walkers pause and others continue. Some of the vehicles pause and others continue. And I am no longer that clock to the air of etc. And something of this city's brute capacity for gathering is like a shining in my head. The valleys of glass and reset stone have softer, smaller forces pushing through them. 
with shopping bags like pollen sacks attached to their bodies. Happiness is only a state of utter absorption, so why not take an island, not large, and see the people of the world live together there? I noticed first they put the brown people in brown shirts and made them stand behind the counter in Starbucks as the customers are played by whites and East Asian girls. Each consciousness enacts its own drama in the silence of a breathing mind till Ahmed, the barista, calls your name. On Bleeker and Mercer, the jackhammers answer and a rising siren answers. But what I'd like to listen to is rain. No, the plainness of its thinking, the fat splatter of the first ripe drops on the hot sidewalk, its hiss, its consistence, its soft shoe shuffle, the grid clearing and darkening as the Atlantic rolls in. I finished with two wee love poems. Well, one's a love poem, one's an, one's an anti love poem. What would that a hate poem? So, I read one called Incantation. Incantation, there's three sentences in it. One of them's Frank O'Hara's, one of them's Hart Crane's, and one of them's Kurt Vonnegut's. Incantation. Because we time travel into the future at a blistering 60 minutes an hour, I ask you to sit down and write me one beautiful sentence I might carry in my pocket on the journey when I go. And in the window of the train unfold, oh, you are the best of all my days. Never knowing if the thing is broken or the door between us is still open, you would like me to sit down and write you one beautiful sentence you might carry in your wallet when you leave. And in the cab, you take it out and read, permit me voyage, love, into your hands. Depending where one stands, each circle back is a possible fall, a fail, a spiral. And I would like you to take a few seconds to write me out one beautiful sentence to carry now across the night and ocean. And held up at the gate, I sit down and open. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. Finish with a wee poem called La Mediterranea. You see, the problem is you're on a hiding to nothing if you you, you really shouldn't title a poem something that you can't say. Um, for some reason I did that. It's the name of a, re a restaurant that whenever I do the NYU Paris thing, I live beside. I don't know about you lot, but when you've been married for a long time, you start to navigate by places where you've had massive arguments in restaurants. When you see them, you're like, yeah, we had a massive argument in that restaurant. Anyway, this is, <laughs> this is one of the restaurants I had a massive argument. Um, yeah, La Mediterranea or something like that. Okay. In the midst of our life like life, I come to this fork in your hand, stainless silver of appreciable weight, and I fully understand its pronginess, the bent of want, an expressive head and narrow neck spreading like a delta out to three strict parallels. You the children, me. At some point, the waiter brought you a sea bass and the fork hovers over its seared arrangement of chain mail, its lips parted in surprise. Against the stiff table linen and sunlight on the fork, your skin is caramel and scuffed a little whitely at the knuckles. A few veins give the skin its dark ridges and where each hair plants itself, there is a small dent and crinkle in the flesh. If the situation is not stable, nor sustainable, what I want to mention is if we did continue further in, into an atom of the flesh or the metallic fabric of the fork, the micro weft of the tablecloth, it would be more or less the same kind of utter emptiness. As at the heart of any restaurant, there is this dead eye of the sea bass on your plate. Its aureole lens, its lightless pupil, sunk flush as a thumbtack holding the universe itself in place. And I stare at it and it stares back. Thank you.
It's a wonderful feeling to be in this room all together hearing my friends and fellow writers and beloved colleagues. It takes me back 35 years uh, when I first started teaching at NYU. And, uh, and it was a new, young program. And Galway Cannell and E.L. Doctorow and Paul Marshall were our, our three uh, um, guiding lights. And one thing I especially liked about it was that unlike the many other places where I would do a semester a as an adjunct, NYU was at night. So people who work nine to five would um, be here. Oh, what I wanted to say, thank you for signing. Thank you, thank you. Mm. I love to see the words go back into the body and then be shared again. It's so great. So um, I'm going to read three or four poems. And I'm going to start with this one, uh, the first poem in, a, in this book of mine that's just come out. And this poem is called, For You. In the morning, when I'm pouring the hot milk into the coffee, I put the side of my face near the convex pitcher to watch the last round drop from the spout. And it feels like being cheek to cheek with a baby. Sometimes the orb pops back up, a ball of cream balanced on a whale's watery exhale. Then I gather the tools of my craft, the cherry sounding board tray for my lap, like the writing arm of a desk, the phone, the bird book for looking up the purple Martin. I repeat them as I seek them so as not to forget tray, cell phone, purple, Martin, tray, phone, Martin, Trayvon, Martin. Song was invented for you. All art was made for you. Painting, writing was yours. Our youngest, our most precious, to remind us to shield you. All was yours. All that is left on earth with your body was for you. Ode to the Condom. Rubber, safe, French letter, sleeve, protector of the young, so young they do not yet exist, separator of male and female, bundling board down the middle of a shaker bed, mechitza down the aisle of an Orthodox synagogue, Veil between the matters which create spirits, Trojan, trumpet mute, latex, superfine, reservoir tip, Ramses, forex, some actually made of sheep intestine, sparkling with mammalian life. I never liked you. <laughs> of course, I'd hardly recognize you now, what with your flavors, your ribbed for her, your cap and bells, but bless you, separator of women and men from abortion, separator of health from death, separator of male from male, of well from ill, costume of the life force, best friend of the earth. And this is a, another ode. 
Amaryllis Ode. When the blossoms were wilting, I cut the stalk and put it in a glass before my trip to have waiting for me the damp, withering blooms to see when I came back. I thought of the female side of my genealogy, the mothers who have liked to have waiting upstairs, a daughter stripped to be punished, and I realized I had been my mother's conduit to the satisfaction of being, in her own time, the beater. I think she did not know what she was doing. And it is nice, isn't it, to have something waiting, the knowledge of which will thrill you. How much drier will the blossoms be? How everted each pistol tip on its coral stalk dusted with ochre seed. My mother and I were a twosome, as her mother and she had been, and her mother's mother. Mine used to perform a tune, not when she was beating on me. White coral bells upon a silver stalk. It was a pleasure for me to be head, 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 head the amaryllis, to slit its throat. The last verse was, Oh, don't you wish that you could hear them ring? That will happen only when the fairies sing, or in our case, when the dead mothers weep. My mother would weep to read this. <clears throat> and I want to end my portion by doing something that I've started doing recently, which is read a poem so new that it's not typed yet. Because this program is also about trying things and seeing what we can do when we follow our impulses and writing something new and uh, showing it to each other. So I thought in the spirit of a creative writing program, I would uh, read this first draft that I <laughs> wrote this morning. <laughs> and. Uh, we'll see. <laughs> In his last weeks for Carl, sometimes now when he comes into my mind, I think of him as a very large, small mammal smaller than a beaver, but smart like that, and with a sense of design and family. And sometimes when he sleeps, mouth open, he looks without breath like a mouse. It's because of how the hair grew back on his temples and jowls and neck when he quit the chemo as if throwing himself off the earth in order to throw the chemo off the earth. When I first met him, he was sliding down off a bar stool, smiling, his smile the same curve of his forehead and chin, his whole face beaming, and he was so big, big head, big chest, big arms, big stomach, big strong legs, and he was so clean, fresh from the shower, as if he had just been created, still a little moist, like a farmer god of a juicy field. It was June. We were on a blind date. He was a little taller than me. He was massive just behind me, going to the table, 
where he laid his forearm on top of mine. He's the same man now, though the cancer has taken a lot from him and given him a lot of room for tenderness, for wisdom and courage. Little did I know when I climbed trees as a child, I was practicing to clamber up rather gracefully into his hospice bed and fit myself between his almost slaughtered from within bulk and the railing, whereupon we fall into a sleep deep and sweet as a dream of heaven an hour's respite from his oncoming death and the oncoming death of the earth. Hi. Um, as I'm last, I'd, I'd like to thank Deborah again. Um, I don't think it's that usual to be such a rabid fan of your own colleagues, but that's, that's the situation I find myself in. It's a very unusual job and a very remarkable program. Um, I'm going to read a, just one story, a short one. Um, on, on this remarkable program, students often are wondering about what perspective to write from, and I'm often wondering the same thing. And in this case, I want to write a story about atrocity. And whenever I thought about putting it in one place with one group of people, I, I thought that would be a kind of lie, as there's no place on earth and no community on an earth free of atrocity. So the challenge became to write a story about everywhere at the same time. So this is called Two Men Arrive in a Village. Two men arrive in a village, sometimes on horseback, sometimes by foot, in a car or astride motorbikes, occasionally in a tank, having strayed far from the main phalanx, and every now and then from above in helicopters. But if we look at the largest possible picture, the longest view, we must admit that it is by foot that they have mostly come. And so in this sense, at least, our example is representative. In fact, it has the perfection of parable. Two men arrive in a village by foot, and always a village, never a town. If two men arrive in a town, they will obviously arrive with more men and far more in the way of supplies. That's simple common sense. But when two men arrive in a village, their only tools may be their own dark or light hands, depending. Though most often they will have in these hands a blade of some kind, a spear, a longsword, a dagger, a flick knife, a machete, or just a couple of rusty old razors sometimes a gun. It has depended and continues to depend. What we can say with surety is that when these two men arrived in the village, we spotted them at once at the horizon point where the long road that leads to the next village meets the setting sun. And we understood what they meant by coming at this time. Sunset has historically been a good time for the two men wherever they have arrived, for at sunset we are all still together. The women are only just back from the desert, or the farms, or the city offices, or the icy mountains. The children are playing in dust near the chickens, or in the communal garden outside of the towering apartment block. The boys are lying in the shade of cashew trees, seeking relief from the terrible heat, if they are not in a far colder country, tagging the underside of a railway bridge. And most important, perhaps, the teenage girls are out in front of their huts, or houses, wearing their jeans, or their saris, or their veils, or their lycra miniskirts, cleaning, or preparing food, or grinding meat, or texting on their phones. Depending. And the able-bodied men are not yet back from wherever they have been. Night too has its advantages, and no one can deny that the two men have arrived in the middle of the night on horseback, or barefoot, or clinging to each other on a Suzuki scooter, or riding atop a commandeered government jeep therefore taking advantage of the element of surprise. But darkness also has its disadvantages, and because the two men always arrive in villages and never in towns, if they come by night, they are almost always met with absolute darkness, no matter where in the world or their long history you may come across them. 
and in such darkness you cannot be exactly sure whose ankle it is you have hold of. A crone, a wife, or a girl in the first flush of youth. It goes without saying that one of the men is tall, rather handsome in a vulgar way, a little dim and vicious, while the other man is shorter, weasel face and sly. This short, sly man leaned on the Coca-Cola hoarding that marked the entrance to the village and raised a hand in friendly greeting, while his companion took the small stick that he had up to that point been chewing, threw it on the ground and smiled. They could just as well have been on a lamppost, been leaning on a lamppost and chewing gum, and the smell of borscht could have been in the air. But in our village, we do not make borscht. We eat couscous and tilefish, and that was the smell in the air, tilefish, which even to this day, we can hardly bear to smell because it reminds us of the day the two men arrived in the village. The tall one raised his hand in friendly greeting, at which moment the cousin of the wife of the chief who happened to be crossing the long road that leads to the next village, felt she had no choice but to stop opposite the tall man, his machete glorious in the sun, and raise her hand, though her whole arm shook as she did so. The two men liked to arrive in this manner with a more or less friendly greeting, and this might remind us of the fact that all humans, no matter what they do, like very much to be liked, even if it's for only an hour or so before they are feared or hated. Or maybe it would be better to say that they like the fear that they inspire to be leavened with other things, such as desire or curiosity, even if, in the final analysis, fear is always the greater part of what they want. Food is cooked for them. We offer to make them food or else they demand it, depending. At other times, on the 14th floor of a derelict apartment building covered in snow, in which a village lives vertically, the two men will squeeze onto a family sofa in front of their television and watch the new government's broadcast, the new government they've established by coup, and the two men will laugh at their new leader marching up and down the parade ground in that stupid hat, and as they laugh, they'll hold the oldest girl watching television by her shoulder in a supposedly comradely manner, but a little too tightly, while she weeps. Aren't we friends? The tall, dim man will ask her. Aren't we all friends here? This is one way they arrived, though they did not arrive that way here. We have no televisions here and no snow and have never lived above the level of the ground. And yet the effect was the same, the dread stillness and the anticipation. Another girl, younger, brought the plates of food for the two men, or as is the custom in our village, the single bowl. This is good shit, the tall, handsome, stupid one said scooping up tilefish with his dirty fingers, and a little sly one with the face of a rat said, ah, my mother used to make it like this, God rest her shitty old soul. And as they ate, they bounced a girl each on their laps while the older women pressed themselves against the compound walls and wept. After eating and drinking, if it is a village in which alcohol is permitted, the two men will take a walk around to see what is to be seen. This is the time of stealing. The two men will always steal things, though for some reason they do not like to use this word. And as they reach out for your watch or cigarettes or wallet or phone or daughter, the short one in particular will say solemn things like, thank you for your gift, or we appreciate the sacrifice you're making for the cause. Though this will set the tall one laughing and thus ruin whatever dignified effect the short one was trying to achieve. At some point, as they move from home to home, taking whatever they please, a brave boy will leap out from behind his mother's skirts and try to overpower the short, sly man. In our village, this boy was a 14-year-old we all used to call King Frog, owing to the fact that once, when he was four or five years old, somebody asked him who had the most power in our village, and he pointed to a big, ugly toad in the yard and said, him, King Frog. And when asked why, explain, because even my father is afraid of him. At 14, he was brave, but reckless, which was why his wide hip mother had thought to tuck him behind her skirts as if he were a baby. But there is such a thing as physical courage, real, persistent, very hard to explain, existing in tiny pockets here, there, and everywhere, and though almost always useless, it is still something you don't easily forget once you've seen it, like a very beautiful face or a giant mountain range. It sets a limit somehow on your own hopes for yourself. And sensing this, maybe the tall dim one raised his gleaming machete and with the same fluid, 
yet effortless gesture with which you might take the head off a flower separated the boy from his life. Once blood has been shed, especially such a quantity of blood, a kind of wildness descends, a bloody chaos, into which all the formal gestures of welcome and food and threat seem instantly to dissolve. More drink is generally taken at this point, and what is strange is that the old men in the village, who, though men, have no defence, will often now grab at the bottle themselves, drinking deeply and weeping, for you need courage, not only to commit bloody chaos, but also to sit by and watch it happen. But the women, how proud we are in retrospect of our women, who stood in formation, arms linked the one to the next in a ring around our girls, as the tall, dim man became agitated and spat on the floor. What's wrong with these bitches? Waiting is over any longer and I'll be too drunk. And the short, sly one stroked the face of the chief's wife's cousin. The chief's wife was in the next village visiting family and spoke in low, conspiratorial tones of the coming babies of the revolution. We understand that women stood so in ancient times, beside white stone and blue seas, and more recently in the villages of the elephant god, and in many other places, old and new. Still, there was something especially moving about the pointless courage of our women at that moment, though it could not keep two men from arriving in the village and doing their worst, it never has and never will. And yet there came that brief moment when the tall, dim one seemed cowed and unsure, as if the woman now spitting at him were his own mother, which passed soon enough when the short, sly one kicked the spitting woman in her groin and the formation broke and bloody chaos found no more obstruction to its usual plans. The next day, the story of what happened is retold in partial, broken versions that changed depending very much on who is asking, a soldier, a husband, a woman with a clipboard, a morbidly curious visitor from the next village, or the chief's wife returned from her sister-in-law's compound. Most will put a great emphasis on certain questions. Who were they? Who were these men? What were their names? What language did they speak? What marks were on their hands and faces? But in our village, we are very fortunate to have no rigid bureaucrats, but instead the chief's wife, who is, when all is said and done, more of a chief to us than the chief has ever been. She is tall and handsome and sly and courageous. She believes in the Gar Haramata, that wind which blows here hot, here cold, depending, and which everybody breathes in. You cannot help but breathe it in, though only some will breathe out in bloody chaos. For her, such people become nothing more than Gar Haramata. They lose themselves, their names and faces, and can no longer claim merely to bring the whirlwind. They are that wind. This is, of course, a metaphor, but she lives by it. She went straight to the girls and asked for their account and found one who, encouraged by the sympathetic manner of the chief's wife, told her story in full, the end of which was the most strange for the short sly one had thought himself in love, and afterward, laying his sweaty head on this girl's bare chest, had told her that he too was an orphan, though it was harder for him, for he'd been an orphan for many years rather than mere hours, and that he had a name and a life and was not just a monster, but a boy who had suffered as all men suffer and had seen horror and wanted now only to have babies with this girl from our village, many boy babies, strong and beautiful, and girls too, yes, why not girls? And live far from all villages and towns with this army of children encircling and protecting the couple all their days. He wanted me to know his name, the girl exclaimed, still stunned by the idea. He had no shame. He said he did not want to think that he had passed through my village through my body without anybody caring what he was called. It is probably not his real name, but he said his name was... But our chief's wife stood up suddenly, left the room, and walked out into the yard. Thank you. Let's have another round of applause for all our writers. <laughs>